So first of all, uh, Demandware is a public company. So Chuck, I'm going to leave you the fun part. What the heck does this forward-looking statement mean, and why do we care about it anyway? Just, Just go to the next slide. <laughs> 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 you have to do this whenever you're a public company because you get in trouble if you don't. Lawyers are all everywhere. Very good. I'm not going to say any more than that. You take full liability. That's it. No. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, Demandware is at the confluence of three significant markets. It's in the retail market, it's also, which is a, a $12 trillion market. It's also in the e-commerce marketplace, and it's in the global SaaS market, for, uh, each of which is very big. So, it fills one of the categories we were talking about for a valuable company. It has a huge total available market. So, that's important. Let's talk about this for a second. Um, Chuck, I mean, we, we both know this, but why is it that everybody's now challenged to sell and buy stuff or, you know, in so many different channels online? Is it, is it um, uh, all coming through the PC still? No, not at all. So maybe not at this school anyways, maybe other schools, but not, not this school. So how many people here, for example, have bought stuff on uh, their iPhone or a, you know, or a tablet or somewhere else other than the web recently? Good numbers. Okay, so that's the problem that, that we're actually solving. It turns out that there's this multi-channel experience that people want to buy stuff uh, on everything from you know, their mobile phone to even point of sale. And, and uh, when they do that, they want one integrated experience. And in the future, we think there'll be things like, for example, TV uh, and mobile point of sale even that, uh, in fact, it's not even the future, the mobile point of sale is here, mm. uh, that people want to buy through. And so you could keep trying to innovate and build all of these different pieces, but that would be a very expensive R&D experience, as we've talked about. And especially for the customer, it would be very expensive for them to, uh, as a retailer or a brand, to continue to deliver a great online experience if they had to keep building all of these things. So what was our solution, Chuck? Well, when you look at what a customer needs, if you can provide that to them remotely and you can provide the service as, a, as software as a service, then you can be very flexible. Um, it's very inexpensive on a relative basis to establishing uh, your own infrastructure. And it, it can be much more effective because of its flexibility and dyna dynamics. So what Demandware is doing is they're taking that, what was that model that Michael talked about earlier, where a company has to build everything inside, take it outside, offer the service, allow the customer, however, to get in and be can manipulate in ways that they can be, be creative with the offering so that it's not something that's take it or leave it, this is the one flavor. And as a result of that, they get a tremendous amount of value for that um, with, their, with, their, uh, with their offering on the web. So it becomes effectively the best of both worlds. It's like outsourcing that entire cost center, but you effectively get the ability to customize it and leverage it in the way you want. So that is what is at the core of their value proposition. Um, I think we, the question we, we asked ourselves early on in the business is what would be our multipliers and levers in this business? So uh, let's just cover these so you can get a sense of this. At the core of this is this, um, what can be described as a, the, the infrastructure that is highly reliable. By the way, this is more reliable than Amazon, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. We've had less outage than Amazon has, and right now we handle you know, hundreds of millions of customers and billions of dollars worth of commerce. So this was at the core of this, but we now consider this table stakes. We now don't even really talk about this. It's like, okay, well, you've got to do that. The key differentiators are what the customers really want to do, which is they don't want to spend any time on that. They want to do the merchandising and marketing and things that actually make their brands really stand out. And so that's where all the, the value is being placed. So we've actually shifted our core demandware from being initially unbelievably highly reliable um, you know, delivery of, of commerce sites to now everything being about how do we make the merchandiser more effective. So it's an interesting shift. And not to say that we can't do the latter, we've still got to do that. I mean, if that ever went down, that would be a big <laughs> challenge for us. What about the multipliers and, and levers? This is the most important piece, and I'll leave you to, to do it because it's the fun piece. We have a shared success model, so do you want to explain that? So the shared success model is um, we set a certain level at the front end of the contract, and if we exceed that level where the revenues are achieved higher, we share in that revenue base. I've been in software my whole career, and I think the reason that this works is because we're doing everything for them. It's not like, I've tried this in other companies where you, we, you know, you'd go in and say, if you do so well, we'll you know, if we get a piece of the action or something, but it's the customer delivering that function. In this case, it's us delivering the function, so they're much more 
readily agreeing to this arrangement. And, uh, and we've been extremely successful. It's also great feedback to know just how well the product is behaving and how uh, successful the customer is with, with their total sales. So I'd actually argue, just to pause for a second and emphasize this, that the single biggest reason that the company has been successful is actually because of that shared success model, at least at a business model level. In other words, if you're a customer and you're typically expected to spend, let's say, tens of millions of dollars, which is what it takes to put up these big uh, enterprise infrastructures, and we come along and we say to you, no, we're going to charge you nothing for it, but we'll charge you a percentage of the revenue that flows through our platform. So as you're more successful selling online and opening up new channels, we will be too. It's such an inviting, why wouldn't you model? And the more successful we are uh, at making them successful, the, the more we profit from it. It's been a huge disruptor in this business. It literally changed the game. And it's why, you know, in a real world example, I wanted to bring it to the fore here. So we talked about um, multipliers and levers. Demandware has got many examples, but this one I wanted to bring to the fore. Turns out e-commerce is a complex landscape. People want to do everything from ratings and reviews and recommendations uh, to integrate it with their back-end auto management systems, et cetera. So we could have done all of that. We could have either built it into our product, but if you remember, I said to you, why would we do that? That's things like co-creation. Why wouldn't we just instead create an open platform that people could augment? And that's what we've done. And so all these people in our link program are able to just connect to and build into our platform all the capabilities they bring. It's a win-win because the customers end up getting more value out of the platform. And because these are pre-integrated, when they buy the platform, they get a broader solution much quicker. So it's a faster time to value. And so everybody's winning in this. And ultimately, we don't care because our business model, right, is not selling software. It's actually making the customer successful. And the more successful they are with the broader set of offerings, the more everybody wins. So the multipliers and levers here can be summed up very simply as in the link program, we're creating a, a broader whole product, fulfilling a broader value proposition. And the lever is it's reducing the cost of integration for the customers and for us, and reduces the time to deploy the higher, uh, gives you faster value. So again, pretty much every business model you look at um, will have these, but the results are pretty spectacular for the company. Um, the content growth rates here are over 50%. If you look back, these are most recent uh, numbers that we just announced as a public company. Uh, the number of customers going live is dramatically increasing. And this is probably the most exciting one of all, which is the average revenue per user, per user here is, is uh, nearly double uh, over this period of time. Uh, all the while, we've got a very highly sticky um, model. The subscription rest margins are also staying very stable and at a very high rate. Uh, I won't go through this, but I'll put it up on the web for you. If you were to look back so you can get a sense of those same percentages we were talking about earlier, you'll also see that all these things that we've been talking about are shifting. R&D's cost is, is the cost that's going down, and we're also trying to get sales and marketing more efficient. All the time, also, we're taking down our cost of revenue dramatically. And ultimately, we've got a very profitable business model here. It'll end up being in, the, in about a 25% to drop to the bottom line. Anything you'd want to add to that? Well, it's the revenue that drives those percentages on the right. As the revenue increases with you keeping steady expenses, that's what drives the model the way it does. And then here's a piece of it that just is very visual, too. So each of our customers actually has mul multiple sites, too. So when we get one customer, they often have multiple brands. So you know, there's, there's many that I could point out here. But you can visually see it in the separation of customers versus sites. So remember when I said make your product slippery? One of the things that, that I could have said is make it self-service. We get our customers up and running to a point where they can build their own sites, deliver their own um, implementations of the product at their own pace. And so you'll get companies like Crocs, for example, that went live in literally a dozen countries on their own without us even touching uh, the software or, or helping them. And so the number of websites has gone up you know, exponentially. And each of those websites is generating more revenue. And of course, we're taking a percentage share of it. That's leverage in your business model. So those are the kinds of things that hopefully you're seeing by example that, that you want to try to reach for.